You know, it's interesting that in many cathedrals around the world, there are still baptistries. Ancient cathedrals, there are still baptistries. One of the famous ones in, in uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, there is in that complex a baptistry. You'll see it right here in the middle in that cathedral complex, a baptistry that exists even to this day, an octagonal baptistry. In, in Rome, the Lateran Baptistry part of the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran in Rome was for many years, and, and it's surrounded. I tried to get a picture, but I, I couldn't. But you have this octagonal baptistry surrounded with these columns. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and for centuries, it was the only baptistry in Rome. Only baptistry by immersion in Rome. Well, it leads to the question, and then, then you have in, in Portiers, France, the baptistry of St. John, one of the earliest Christian churches in the West. You have these baptistries that exist in these old churches, and it begs the question, well, why do we see a different mode today? Father O'Brien writes, for several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually conferred by immersion, but since the 12th century, the practice of baptizing by infusion has prevailed in the Catholic Church as this manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. Interesting choice for the change, isn't it? It's, it's inconvenient to, to be baptized. But there was another reason, too, because into Christianity swept this doctrine without biblical basis of original sin. A child born was guilty of sin, and if he died without baptism, he, would not be, he or she would not be in heaven. And so, child baptism came in because many, many babies died in, bapti- died in infancy in those days. A lack of convenience and child baptism. Sadly, both without biblical precedent. No biblical precedent for, for doing it. But you remember Jesus was baptized, wasn't it? In fact, in one of, the, one of the Gospels, it says that he was baptized there because there was much water there. John was baptizing because there was much water. And by the way, the Jordan River would not be a place that I would choose to be baptized in unless I was at the north end where it comes out of the Sea of Galilee. There it's nice and clean. By the time you get down to Jericho, it looks like coffee. As it snakes its way south down ultimately to the Dead Sea. Because you see the Sea of Galilee is five, six hundred feet below sea level. And by the time you get down to the Dead Sea, you're, you're 12, 1300 feet below sea level. So there's only one way for the water to go. And it picks up a lot of silt on its way downhill. But Jesus is baptized right on schedule according to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We have page numbers because we use page numbers in our, uh, in our uh, seminar in the evenings. Daniel chapter 9. Do what? Oh, the Pew Bibles have the same pagination. Thank you, Pastor. Pew Bibles have the same pagination. Notice in Daniel 9 beginning with verses verses 24 and 25. Seventy weeks, Gabriel tells Daniel, 
are determined for your people and for your holy city, to finish transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. So right on time, Jesus comes. In Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, notice the precision with which the Scripture documents it by inspiration of God's Spirit. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea in the region of Trachonitis, and Lysias, tetrarch of Abilene. So in the 15th year, and then we turn down to verses 21 and 22. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and which I am well pleased. Let me go back. There we go. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was A.D. 27. We know from the command to, to build Jerusalem, it was in 4... 57 B.C., you come down 483 years, you have to add a 1 because, see, there's no 0 year. You go 1 B.C., there's no 0 year. You go 1 B.C., you go 1 A.D., and, and we're up to 2021 today, and it takes us right to 27, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. He became... You notice it said Messiah the Prince? The Hebrew word is Meshiach. It's a great word for clearing your throat. Meshiach. It means Messiah. It, it, we transliterate it as Messiah, but it means the anointed one. Christos in Greek or Christ means the same thing, the anointed one. It's the New Testament version. They're right on schedule. Jesus is baptized. He becomes the anointed one. And to that moment, he spends his time in Nazareth, thereabouts. But going forward from his baptism, he begins his work of ministry here on, on this earth. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, Verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John to Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the dove descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You see, the time of Jesus' baptism was important not only in terms of fulfilling prophecy, but as Jesus is baptized, he sets a pattern for us to follow. As, as, our great, as our great leader. But I want to suggest it's a third reason beyond follow, Jesus' baptism, beyond precisely on time he becomes the anointed one, he sets an example for us. It is also for us an ordination to ministry. It's an ordination for us Every single one of us to ministry. Because you see, we're all called to be ministers. All of us. We have different roles. We have different functions. And then, fourthly, it is the scriptural 
memorial of Jesus' resurrection. Now, a lot of people make a big deal about a day. But according to the scriptures, his baptism is the memorial. Baptism is the memorial of his resurrection. We're going to look at that a little bit more, uh, more clearly. The word is not translated. We've talked about this in our, in our meetings night by night from time to time. The, the, the word is not translated. It is trans... Now, when you translate, you give what? The meaning, right? But when you transliterate, you take vowels and consonants in English that most closely approximate the original language. Baptizo is the Greek word. It comes from the textile industry. Well, how are you going to dye cloth unless you baptize it? Now, we're not talking about a tie-dye, but we're, we're talking about, you know, wanting to dye something, really dye it. You have to baptize it. That's, that, that's what the, that was the word they used in the textile industry. And Christianity took that word and, and appropriated it to use to describe that, that uh, rite of passage by which we become a part of the body of Christ. God only knows the heart, but I, but I wonder if it was transliterated rather than translated for a reason. You know, I, I could leave that one with God, but... Because there's another form of baptism widely practiced. Again, I've got to leave that with God because God only knows the heart. But even though it wasn't translated, you know what it means, don't you? You have a baptistry. Yours is not octagonal like in some of those early cathedrals, but it still does the same job, doesn't it? It still does the same job. In Romans 5, the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, we have the key passage on baptism in the New Testament. Paul in his letter to the church at Rome. And remember, as we've talked about night by night in our seminar, that, that the scriptures, the, the scripture verses and chapter divisions and punctuation are editorial. Because they didn't exist originally. They didn't exist originally. They were added by editors. The reason being, for those of you that weren't with us, if you look at the original manuscripts of the New Testament, they're written in capital letters. There's no space between words. You go from left margin to right margin and come back to left margin. It's a constant sea of letters. If you're ever... In, the, in London, make sure you go to the British Library. There you can see the Sinaiticus, the New Testament manuscript that Tischendorf found at St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai. It's amazing to look at. It's a fourth century manuscript. That manuscript, and when I say the word, say the name of the next one, you can probably guess where that is, the Vaticanus. You got that one figured out? I figure you probably did. Those are the two most complete, earliest manuscripts of the New Testament. There's also the Alexandrinus from Alexandria there in the British Library. But there was no space between words. So a lot of times we let chain, uh, streams of thought be interrupted by what the editors did. But let's begin with verse 20 of chapter 5. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now he said that sin abound, where sin abounded, you know, grace abounded. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. In the King James, it uses the phrase, you remember what it uses? God forbid. God forbid. It's the Greek word meganoita. It's, it's an expression of utter horror. 
Utter horror. Paul says, it, it, you know, I can't even comprehend that we would sin so that there could be more grace. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Wow. There's a lot in those verses, isn't there? Jesus, Paul likens our baptism to Jesus' baptism. You see, our carnal nature, we all know this by... We, we, we recognize it pretty early on, don't we? Our carnal nature is... Opposed to the things of God. It, it, naturally, it naturally is. We don't, we don't want to do what, what he wants us to do. Notice Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 6 and 7. I've got to get the right angle here for my bifocals. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So that's where we live. That's, we're not talking about original sin. We're talking about a bent that we have toward wrong. We have to be willing to die to that. And Paul says if we're willing to die to that and be buried and we are united with Christ in his death. We are buried with him through baptism into death, and we come forth to newness of life. In verse 13 of chapter 8, he tells us how we can deal with this this natural tendency because of choices that Adam Adam and Eve made long before us, how we can deal with these tendencies toward wrong, our in our carnal nature that we all were born with. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But notice, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see, the Holy Spirit plays a very key role in our lives. It helps us to put to death the carnal nature. We still have to live with it until when? Second coming, right? Right? When this corruptible puts on incorruption, this mortal puts on incorruption, and this mortal puts on immortality, we still have to live with it till then. But we don't have to be like a bull with a ring in its nose. Satan doesn't have to have a, drag us around with a ring in our nose and make us do whatever he wants us to do because of God's Spirit. God's Spirit can help us put to death the old nature, and we are buried with baptism with Jesus, and we come up to newness of life. Now, the catch is sometimes we're buried alive. We don't choose to die to sin. And if we're buried alive, We're shortchanging God's ability to change us, aren't we? We can't can't risk being buried alive. For if, chapter 6, verse 5, for if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, Another way of saying, put to death, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. 
For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace." If we choose to die, we choose to be buried in baptism, die to our old life, we'll come up new. But if we choose to be buried alive, we're not going to come up to a new life. I can't speak for you, but... I need all the new life I can get. How about you? Need all the new life I can get. We have to die to self. We have to be willing to surrender it to Jesus. And Jesus is willing to take it and make something new. And then make us alive to Christ. So as we think about baptism, it's dying to our past sinful way of life. We accept Jesus and, it, and it's a public expression that we have chosen to die to our past sinful way of life. Yes, we have a carnal nature. We still have to live with it until Jesus comes, but it doesn't have to control us. It doesn't have to dominate us. We bury our sins. None of us have a record that's worth writing home about, do we? None of us. But he buries it in the watery grave of baptism. And in fact, elsewhere in the scripture, he says he buries it in the depths of where? The sea. Do any of you scuba dive? I, I see one hand. I'm trying to remember uh, right now, but about every 32 or 33 feet, you have another atmosphere of pressure. And the deeper you go, the, the more intense the pressure becomes. And unless you're a professional diver, you should not dive below 100 feet. I remember years ago on a mission trip when we were in R&R, &R, we were diving off of, uh, uh, off of uh, Providentialis, the capital of the Turks and Caicos, and we were diving on a wall in the Atlantic. It goes several thousand feet down to the bottom of the ocean. And, it, and it's sort of spooky. You're, 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 you're swimming down there 70, 80 feet, and here's this wall. You know it's going down to the bottom of the ocean. I was reading last night because we were, we were in worship. We were talking about penguins with our kids, and, and I wanted to see how long a penguin could hold its breath the emperor penguin, which, which is about 30, 32, 33, 34 inches tall, the biggest of the penguins, can swim underwater for up to 27 minutes. And I can hold my breath about a minute, but that's a far cry from 27 minutes. Far cry. And they can go down to 500 feet. 500 feet. If we allow Jesus to, to, to put to death our sins, the Holy Spirit, and we bury our sins, he buries it in the depth of the sea. He buries it in the watery grave. And then we, war, we rise to a new life in Christ Jesus. We don't look back. We keep looking forward to Jesus 
And as we keep looking forward to Jesus, what does he do? He changes us because, you remember the Apostle Paul says, by beholding we become what? Changed. You know, our, our tendency as humans is we want to look at our sin. But what we look at changes us. So if we continue to look at our sin, we do more sin. But if we look to Jesus, he changes us. And we do less sin because we want to become like him. We become changed. We come to walk in a newness of life. We walk with Jesus every say. And as I mentioned earlier, According to Romans chapter 6, the great memorial of Christ's resurrection is not a day. It's not a day. But it's our baptism. Baptism by which a Christian becomes a part of the body of Christ. That is the great memorial of the resurrection. It's our ordination to ministry, as, as, we, as we mentioned briefly with, with Jesus earlier. From his, ministry, from his baptism forward, Jesus was involved in ministry. Before that, he wasn't. And so should we. You see, in 1 Corinthians 12, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4 are the great chapters that describe spiritual gifts. And, and here in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12... The Apostle Paul <clears throat> uses the word charismata to describe these gifts. Have you ever heard anything close to charismata? Charismatic, yes. Charismatic. Literally means gifts of grace. Charis is the Greek word for grace. Gifts of grace. And notice in chapter 11, or verse 11, we don't choose. The Spirit chooses. So we think about baptism or ordination to ministry. The Holy Spirit rested on, on Jesus. The Holy Spirit rests on us. He's the one that's led us to that point of baptism. But one and the same Spirit, verse 11, works all these things, distributing each one individually as He wills, as the Holy Spirit wills. He gives them as he wills. I didn't want to be a pastor. When I was a junior in academy, 1972, I graduated a, 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 10 years after you, Sandra. And uh, Lawrence and I have been talking because he graduated a year before me. And, uh, and Jesse graduated uh, a year before that. So, But... Um, I wanted to be a lawyer, and my Bible teacher recruited us students to do the preaching in Mission 72, which was the first division-wide evangelistic outreach. We didn't have video projectors and, and personal computers. All only computers we had then were in climate-controlled rooms. All we had were 35-millimeter slides, you know, that's the dinosaur age, right? We had, we had 35 millimeter slides and sermon manuscripts, and our Bible teacher recruited the students to do the preaching. And during that time, we actually held two evangelistic meetings. Uh, we, the start dates were staggered so we could preach our sermons in both, both uh, meetings. I was in Sandy View Academy, far northwest corner of Albuquerque. And during that time, God called me to ministry. wouldn't take no for an answer. But 30 years later, that was 1972, 30 years later, in 2002, he opened the door for me to go to night school for four and a half years on top of my full-time work. It wasn't easy. But, you see, we don't choose the gifts. The Spirit chooses what gifts to give us. And Paul, here in this verse, compares the gifts to the human body. They fulfill a role. For example, look down at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one, so it is with Christ. 
Notice verse 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them the body, just as he pleased. And if all were one member, where would the body be? You see, he gives to each one of us different gifts. And to gather to the glory of God, we make up the body of Christ. I guess the question we have to ask is, are we using those gifts? Or to borrow a military term, are we AWOL, absent without leave? I, I pray not the latter. Because God needs all of us. He needs all, what all of us can contribute from our life's experience. Because, you see, he has a work for us to do. It's still unfinished. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, will be finished. He says in Matthew 28, some of the last words to his disciples, all authority or power has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You might assume if you're following along in the King James where it says, Go ye therefore and teach, we're talking about the same word as teaching in verse 20, but it's, but it's a different word. And the newer version is actually a little bit more accurate to say, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Make disciples. Well, my, there we go. By the way, that phrase is an imperative. Now, I've never been in the military, but those who have been have brought me up to speed on the peril of disobeying an order. You do that at great peril. This is an order from Jesus to go and make disciples. Disciple making is a multiplicative process. You have one disciple and makes two. Two make four, four make eight, eight make 16, 16 make 32, 32 make 64, 64 make 128, 120 make 256, and, and so it goes. We're to make disciples. That's why Christianity spread like fire in the stubble in the first century. And then I briefly touched on teaching is is not the same word in both places. It's not teach. Now, the second word there in verse 20 is, is the regular word for teaching. And notice we make disciples of all the nations. Those that have been in our meetings night by night know that there's a Greek word behind that word nation. It's a Greek word ethnos, from which we get our word ethnic. The gospel is to go to every ethnic group. Jesus is not concerned about political entities. He's concerned about ethnic groups. And every single one of them must hear the good news of the gospel. We're to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word name here, onomos, is in the singular, which emphasizes their unity. But then there's, it's an interesting thing in terms of the Greek construction here that you have two different rules of Greek grammar at this point in, in, in the Greek text. And these two rules of Greek grammar both say that there are three distinct individuals. Both the rules of Greek grammar say there are three distinct individuals. But what's the most important reason we know there are three? Who's talking? Who's talking? What, type, what color print is in your Bible? Which is Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is speaking. He says there are three. And he doesn't lie, does he? 
We are to make disciples of every ethnic group, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you and I'm with you always to the end of the world. You see, our baptism is not the end, is it? It's the beginning of our walk with Jesus. Just like uh, graduation speakers tell us at commencement, this is not the end. This is the commencement. This is the beginning of the rest of your life. And our job as the body of Christ is to grow in grace, isn't it? Learning more and more and more and sharing more and more as we walk with Jesus. And I'm excited. I'll be honest with you. I'm very excited with what you are doing here in this community in terms of taking the gospel commission seriously. Reaching out and touching those in need in, in a very, very special and practical way. You're doing that. You're involved in a number of different, different ministries in, in the community. In fact, next, uh, uh, early next year sometime, I'm going to be in touch with uh, the leaders of your ministry. My wife and I lead out in the... Uh, are the co-pathfinder leaders for Cicero. And we want to bring our kids over and join you on a Sabbath afternoon as you touch the lives of people desperately in need of your community. Because you know what I'm persuaded of? We've got to get our kids involved in mission. If we don't get them involved in mission, we'll continue to lose them. We've got to get them involved in mission. Serving others in Jesus' name. Make a difference in their lives. And it's exciting to see how you're, how you're doing that. And I want to say again, thank you for how you've sponsored and supported our evangelistic series. You've delivered Bible studies. You sent out invitations for people to sign up for Bible studies. You delivered Bible studies. Scores of Bible studies in the area around the church here. Including... Bible studies to Tammy. Now, Sandra told me she was a little bit hard to catch at home. <laughs> but they still left them. And they left a note. You know, if we don't sow gospel seed, we're not going to have harvest, are we? We're not going to have a harvest. I live, in, live out in farm country. I've got farm fields on three sides of me. And every year I see planters come out and plant seed, throw it away in the ground, thousands of dollars worth of seed in an organized manner with a planter. But if they don't do that, they're not going to have a harvest, are they? You've got to sow the seed. And you started sowing the seed. She attended evangelistic meetings a few years ago by... By Pastor Eric Frecking. She started attending church. Started attending church. And she's been to, and you've encouraged her and supported her in her walk with God. And she's attended, attended our meetings. She's attended our meetings here faithfully, night by night. And because of your love and your encouragement, she's taking the step of following Jesus in baptism today. And you know, I believe there are many, many more out there in this community that you're going to have the privilege of loving and encouraging and supporting and taking, taking this step. Because you see, Jesus wants everyone to hear the good news of the gospel, doesn't he?